Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Uh, welcome to Primetime TV Library. We're winding down the 2011-2012 primetime season. And it's been a great year of collaboration between the friends of the DU Library and many offices on campus whose mission is to encourage lifelong learning beyond the classroom for the entire Bethel community. If you missed some of the presentations this year or you want to revisit some of the presentations, uh, there's a URL, there's a website that you can go to. The cards are right there on this little table by the snacks and sweets and treats right here um, that you can go to and check out some of the recordings. Join us next Tuesday, May 8th, for the last prime time of the season. We'll be celebrating the publication of It's Milking Time, a children's book by Dr. Phyllis Alter of the English Department. Oh, I'm saying it correctly. She'll be sharing the journey to publication and then do a reading of her book. Today we welcome Samuel Mulberry as he presents You Can't Get There From Here or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Idea of Online CWC. Let's welcome Samuel. Yeah. Well thanks for uh, oh, okay thanks for coming today. I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the pre-show. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, today. Um, what I want to do today is to share a story about how a group of really committed brick-and-mortar teachers who never took an online course, never taught an online course, and maybe still aren't sure online teaching is a good idea, um, decided to convert their, to try converting uh, their massive, well-established um, face-to-face course into an online format uh, and how we got excited about the idea of doing that. I want to say two things uh, in full disclosure. Uh, first off, we've never taught online CWC, so I feel a little weird talking about a course that we haven't taught yet. Um, in fact, we're not slated to teach it until the summer of 2013, so this really is a work in progress. I'm trying to convince Chris a year from now that he should do another presentation where we show stuff when we're actually really close to teaching the class. Um, but this is more of a story about how we um, started to change our minds a little bit uh, in terms of this being possible. Another thing that, that I want to say is that um, when I signed up to do this uh, this talk, it, I, didn't, I didn't know it was going to fit into the talk about teaching category, which makes me feel a little bit nervous. Um, I was just, I'm a 1999 Bethel grad. Uh, as I look around this room, I see lots of people who I've watched teach as a student and a colleague. Quite frankly, you're better than me at this. Um, so I feel a little weird about trying to tell you anything about teaching, but I'm going to swallow that for the next um, half an hour or so and just sort of move on. But I do feel a little a little odd about that. We love you, Sam. <laughs> right, one of my favorite things about CWC is that um, it's probably one of the best things that ever came out of a meeting. But this isn't this isn't the vision of one one person, but it came out of a meeting around nineteen eighty five or nineteen eighty six when Neil Ettinger, Kevin Gray, Dan Taylor and Mike Holmes uh, got together over a January uh, and were tasked with uh, basically building a course to fit CC313. Um, so they had a size, and they had, um, they had a little bit of a commission on what they needed to do, and they met that January um, and put this together. And, uh, and if a camel is a horse designed by committee, this is one of the best camels ever made. Okay? So um, over the years, lots and lots and lots of different people have talked to CWC. A lot of them um, are in this room right now. Some people still teach it. Some people haven't taught it for years. But one of the other nice things about the class is it was created out of a spirit of collaboration and, and love. And I think it's always been taught out of a spirit of collaboration. The first thing we tell a new teacher is just steal from everybody. Don't, don't worry about sort of who owns what or whose ideas or what. Just use it. Um, so it's to the point where if you've ever taught CWC, you're still kind of teaching it. Things you've contributed are still going on in the class. Um, so you never really stop teaching the course. You just maybe aren't physically in the room anymore. Um, the, the theme verse for CWC is Hebrews 11 uh, through 12.1. And, and 12.1 is something we, we focus in on, this idea of the, the cloud of witnesses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And we talk with our students about you know, this idea of the historical cloud of witnesses and how um, the author of Hebrews is really talking about um, the, the Old Testament heroes of the faith, right, and that this cloud of witnesses. And what we want to tell them is that the course of CWC is re recovering or recapturing that Christian memory, 
right? So sort of expanding that cloud of witnesses. And I remember when Neil Ettinger used to um, talk about this verse, he'd always talk about, imagine I'm in 3.13, the third brick over from the right. And he, he always pictured the bricks at the top of the room and it's the cloud of witnesses, all these people were sitting up on the bricks. And I don't know who sits where, except for the third brick on the right was where John Calvin would sit. <laughs> and we'd always you know, so whenever he would, would uh, be teaching about Calvin, he'd look up in case he was saying something a little shaky, he would have to check with Calvin. Um, and I sort of took this to heart when I started teaching CWC. So Calvin still sits there. Uh, but for me, Neil's sitting right next to him. So when I lecture on Calvin, I not, not only look at Calvin, but I also check with Neil to make sure. You know, and this, and this sort of idea of this cloud of witnesses um, continues. This is a course that has profoundly uh, shape my life. Um, that's an important part of the story that I want to talk about today. Um, this is a picture of me teaching CWC uh, on February 12, 2012. Um, this is a picture taken by Dan Yim, who I think is here, right? Uh, the back of class. I'm not sure why he took a picture of me, but he did and he sent it to me. And he didn't know this, but he took a picture of me on probably what was one of my best days um, as a, a teacher here at Bethel. Because here I am teaching CWC the way it's supposed to be taught, right? I'm up in front of a group, I'm talking. I have a PowerPoint, but we're talking about a really important text. We're talking about confessions. We're trying to stay close to the text. I'm writing on the board and it's chalk. I'm doing, I'm doing the things that this is the way I'm supposed to teach. This is the way CWC is supposed to look. And um, this is my favorite lecture to give. So this is me at my, at my best. This is one of my best days. And what's weird is there's a weird thing about this day, though, and it sort of fits one of the paradoxes of today. Because at the same time that I'm teaching this in the face-to-face -face way it was intended to be taught, later that afternoon um, I posted on Moodle one of the first of a series of interactive online apps that are going to be part of the groundwork, the technological groundwork for online CWC. So the thing you have to know about me is I'm really a pretty low-tech person. Um, I don't, I like chalk. I like chalk over whiteboards. That's not even technology, but I like, I like to write with chalk. Um, I don't own a cell phone. I've never owned a cell phone. I don't even own a computer other than my, which one's mine? My Bethel issued sidearm. I don't own a computer. Like, I'm, I'm a pretty low-tech person. If you call me or email me, I'm likely to walk to your office rather than email you back or pick up the phone. Um, but at the same time, I really think there's some interesting things that we can do with technology. Um, and this phrase here, when they finally sit down to write the history of CWC, is I, whenever Chris and I talk about the course, I have this tendency to say this phrase. And it's kind of a ridiculous phrase because who would ever want to write or read the history of CWC? But I, I like to reflect on the course a lot because for me it's not just a course, but it's a tradition and it's a long tradition. I think traditions are worth reflecting on and thinking about. Um, and when they write the history of CWC, they might think about this day as a, an interesting turning point when we started to make some interesting moves towards the online course, but that really remains to be seen. Without a doubt, the summer of 2006, um, when we had our summer faculty meetings um, in June, um, that is definitely something, when they write the history of CWC, that will be really a, a watershed moment that I keep talking about this, they, no one's ever going to write, sir, but 2006 was important. Um, it was, it was the, a time when CWC really started to experience, um, I think, live out a generational shift that was happening in the course. Um, it was a time when uh, a lot of deep friendships, I think, were st started to solidify in the class, and we started to move in lots of directions. It was also the first time that I think the, the notion of online CWC was brought up, um, and we decided resoundingly that this was a terrible idea, that this course shouldn't be taught online, um, that we could come up with, with a myriad of reasons why the class needed to be taught face to face. Um, and we spent the next six years trying to push CWC in every other direction, trying to grow it in lots of different ways. We were really focused on what is the, um, the image of the course to students and trying to work on that. But all the while, while we were explaining why it was a bad idea, we started to realize if it, if that it can't be done, but we started to realize that you know, maybe there are ways that it could be done. And we decided the only way we could do it is if we set this bar so high that we couldn't actually figure out how to, how to reach that bar. And then we just started to work towards what would it look like to reach that bar, to say, what would, what's the best possible online course we could teach? Um, and we did it in some weird ways. I think we went out of our way to not look at what other online courses looked like, and we just sort of said, we're all people who teach. We know something about teaching. Let's think about what the best course that we could imagine would look like. And we sort of started um, from there. Uh, one of my favorite traditions in CWC uh, in our summer meetings 
uh, is whenever we have a number of new faculty, Kevin Craig always reminds us that we don't know each other very well. Um, and, and even the people we've worked with for a long time, we don't know very well. And he, 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 uh, he, he asks us to take out a chunk of time in our summer meetings to do what he calls intellectual autobiographies, where everybody goes around and basically tells their story, explains how they got to Bethel, how they got to this course, and what they're doing here. Um, and because of my role in CWC and ASK, I get to know a lot of faculty here in a lot of different departments. But I lament the fact that I don't know, really know people that deeply or that well. Um, so what I want to do today is sort of in the spirit of, uh, of, of what Kevin likes us to do in summer meetings, I want to sort of share a little bit of oral history of CWC um, through my story. Uh, and, and part of why I'm doing this is because I want to think about how my story is part of the story of how we got from online CWC is a really bad idea to something that we're excited about. So I want to think a little bit about that oral history. And I realize there's a chance that this um, will seem really self-indulgent, and it probably is. Um, but at the beginning of this lecture on Augustine, and at the beginning of every small group I've ever talked for the last 11 years, I always read this passage from Frederick Buechner's Telling Secrets, which has kind of been an attempted autobiography by Buechner. And I, I read this to them because I say, this unlocks for me what I love about history, what I love about CWC. Um, and I think it also gives, it has embedded in it a challenge to our students. So Buechner, as he's struggling about whether it's worth telling his story, whether it's worth trying to, um, trying to reveal himself and trying to reflect on his story, he says, but I talk about my own life because if on the one hand, hardly anything could be less important. On the other hand, hardly anything could be more important. My story is important, not because it is mine, God knows, but because if I tell it anything like right, the chances are you will recognize that in many ways it's also yours. Maybe nothing's more important than that we keep track, you and I, of these stories of who we are and where we've come from and the people we've met along the way. Because it is precisely through these stories and all their particularity, as I have long believed and often said, that God makes himself known to each of us most powerfully and personally. If this is true, it means to lose track of our stories is to be profoundly impoverished, not only humanly, but also spiritually. And I tell our students, this is what Augustine's doing in Confessions. He's reflecting back on his life, looking for, for him, he's looking for the fingerprints of God in his life. He's looking for how, how he came to the point of his conversion, right, and, and where he went from there. And I always tell my students that, that this type of memoir thinking is something they should do. They should reflect not only on the history of the faith, because that's their story, but also on their individual story. And it'd be hypocritical of me not to do the same, because I always tell them this is a really important thing to do. So as I was preparing this, I wanted to, in the same way I do when I talk about Augustine, I wanted to go back to the very beginnings and think about where does some of this stuff come from. So I'm not going to dwell on this a lot, but I want to sort of tell you a little bit about who I am and how I connect to CWC and how this gets us to online CWC. So I was born in 1977, um, and to give some context, I was born around the time that the, uh, the original Star Wars came out, um, just as GW was finishing his ninth year teaching here at Bethel. Um, and I was born right in that sweet spot where I still have pictures of me dressed like this that exist. If I was born about four years later, I might not have those. Um, as a kid, I was um, probably, probably the kind of kid that, that people needed thought you needed to worry about and maybe didn't need to worry about. I watched a lot of TV as a kid. Um, I, liked, I watched a lot of movies. I liked video games a lot. I mean, these are the things that I grew up on. Um, I also, we also had a, a really early computer. This is, a, if anybody's an old school computer fan, this is a Texas, Texas Instruments 99, I think circa 1982. Um, and one of the things that my, my older brother, Matt, and I both got into programming. We did, we, at a really young age, I think my grandmother, who's a librarian, bought us a book, I think published in 1982, for a book of programming for kids. And we got into that and thought, well, this is really cool. There's really great stuff you could do. And I really, I really liked the type of thinking you did in computer programming. As we got older, we didn't really have a computer that worked. And I remember I had a friend who did. So when I would, I would sit at home with a notebook, and I would write code. And I'd go over to his house, and we'd be playing. And I would sneak off and just type code into the computer to see how things would work. So. Um, I, I really liked those kinds of things. I liked, I liked making games, and I had this dream of somehow being involved in something that I liked, whether it was, you know, entertainment or movies or making video games. Like, that's kind of what I wanted to do. The problem is I really lacked any of the talents to be a performer or, or anything like that. So, I, um, but, but that was always kind of a dream of mine. I graduated from high school in 1995. Um, I, went to, I grew up uh, going to Catholic schools my whole life. I um, went to a great Catholic school in southern Minnesota. Uh, 
in the spring of my senior year of college, I had sort of narrowed my college choices down to, um, to, two, uh, to two schools. And I sat down one day to, do, to read the course catalogs for each school. And I, I read Bethel's course catalog for the 1995-96 school year. And after reading that, I decided, well, that's the school I'm going to go to. It's the most Kevin Craigie thing I've ever done in my life, to read the course catalog and say, yep, that's where I'm going to go. I, I don't know why I picked Bethel, but whoever wrote that, thank you. It's, it's a very odd thing to do. So then in the fall of 1995, um, on September 6, 1995, uh, I was sitting in CC313 on my first day at Bethel, or first or second day at Bethel, uh, and I was enrolled in a course called Christianity and Western Culture. Uh, my small group leader was Dan Ritchie. Uh, the first day of class, Kevin Craig got up and talked and talked about Christianity and Western culture. Um, and although I was a computer science major, I just fell in love with the course. Um, and I just thought, this is something I need to spend more time with. So uh, in the fall of 1996, I applied to be, uh, to be a TA for the course. Um, got a chance to take it again. Uh, in that fall, uh, we were doing our first exam review. And for some reason, none of the other TAs could go to that review, so I had to do it by myself. So I was a pretty shy 19-year-old with about 80 other students in the, in the choir room. And I got up and started to do the exam review because I didn't have another choice. And I found myself realizing how unbelievably fun it was to talk about CWC in front of a big group of people. And it kind of scared me because I didn't know what to do with that. And I remember I went to Kevin Craig the next day, and I told him about it. And he just sort of looked at me and said, so did you feel it? <laughs> what? He said, did you feel like that teacher thing? Yeah, I said, good. And then through that conversation and talking to other, a couple other people, I decided to change my major to history. And to say, I don't know what that's going to mean for me. I don't know what that's going to mean. But I wanted to, what I wanted to do was I wanted to do the things that I saw my CWC props doing. So I said, I'm going to major in history. I'm going to go to graduate school. And I'm going to find a way to teach a course like, like CWC. Another question that I had when I changed my majors, I went to Neil Edding and I said, what should I minor in? So I thought, there's all these electives in the history major, and I, gotta, I wanna make the most of those. And I was, really, I was really nervous about minoring and what I should minor in. And Neil said to me, he said, don't minor, because a minor is not gonna matter. But he said, instead, minor in the best teachers at your school, because you wanna be a teacher, so go watch really good teachers teach. Um, and that's what I did. Um, I, I took great history classes from G.W. Carlson, Diana Magnuson, Kevin Craig, um, and they were great. I went to the Oregon Extension uh, for a semester because I really wanted to, um, I really wanted to think deeply and read deeply, um, and I wanted to see a different way of teaching. So Kevin encouraged me, um, encouraged me to go there. Uh, I took classes from Dale Johnson. I went to the Dominican Republic with Dale Johnson because um, I really liked painting and I, and I wanted to have those experiences. So I took three courses with Dale, and it's funny because you know I, the whole time that I was learning whatever the content was, I was always really interested in how people taught. And it's funny to think, you know, I'm watching Kevin Craig lecture, I'm watching Dale Johnson paint, I'm watching Kathleen Evans lead a discussion, and they probably didn't know this, but as much as I was listening to what they were talking about, I was trying to learn what they were doing, because I thought, I'm never going to take an education class, and I need to learn how to teach. So I just kept, I kept doing that, I kept taking classes from whoever, whoever sounded like they were, they were really great teachers. Um, and then I kept TA, and being a TA has has profoundly shaped my life in um, in ways that I, I can't I can't describe. Not only did it did it help me decide what I wanted to major in, um, but uh, I met my wife. She was a TA <coughs> along with me, so um, so that's obviously a, a very a very important part of my life. CWC has been something that shaped my identity. Um, if you went to Bethel between 1996 and 1999, if you were a freshman in, in that range, I was probably your CWC TA. Um, a couple years ago, I was at a wedding for my college roommate's younger sister, who was a freshman when I was a senior. And Ann and I sat down um, at the table. We were the first ones there. And then a bunch of other people came to the table, and I looked around. And everybody was kind of looking at me funny, and then they were sort of whispering, and then they said, you were my CWC TA. Yeah. All of them. <laughs> yeah. And uh, a couple weeks ago, one of the, the adjuncts who's teaching HR uh, this year came by my office to talk about a student, and she gave me that look, and I was like, what's that? And she said, I think you were my CWC TA. And then I have to always gauge with them when I tell them what I do now. Either it's super cool or kind of sad. That <laughs> so, at any rate, this, is, this sort of became who I was. And in 1999, when I graduated, if you had asked me to design my dream job and say, what do you most want to do? 
I would have said, what I really want to do is what Virginia Lettinger does. I really want to teach CWC. I really want to work with students. I really want to try to help students uh, to succeed in college. That's what I wanted to do. Um, the year after I graduated, I went to Mobile, Alabama, worked through the Catholic Volunteer Program. I taught art in a high school for a year, lived with four elderly Catholic brothers, um, made $100 a month that I didn't ever need to spend. It was just a really interesting move back into a community, back into some of my religious roots in terms of kind of re-entering uh, Catholicism. Uh, at that time, while I was down there, I applied to the University of Minnesota, and thanks to Diana Magnus, and I got into the University of Minnesota. <laughs> Um, and I spent the next three years there um, looking at historical census data on microfilm uh, as part of my research assistantship, which is as exciting as it sounds. Um, and I'll just leave it at that, and you can determine if you think that sounds exciting or not. I spent a lot of my time uh, in graduate school looking at um, intersections between art and American history, um, I, uh, and, and then looking at American immigration. And in 2001, the fall of 2001, I got the first little part of my dream, which was Virginia asked me if I would come back and lead small groups. So I started as an adjunct um, at 24, um, teaching with a BA. I don't know if you can do that, but I had a BA, and I was um, teaching uh, CWC small groups. Uh, and it was sort of the beginning of, of kind of moving towards something that I really wanted, um, really wanted to do. In 2003 uh, was really a big moment uh, in the history of the course, uh, because this was the year that the Lettingas uh, decided to move. Uh, and a couple of really important things happened that would, that would shape the course greatly going forward. Um, first off, on the BNF Mod lecture team, Sarah Shady started teaching CWC that year. I, and, and I moved um, from an adjunct teaching um, small groups to a lecturer on the team and to the person who oversaw the TAs. Um, so basically at 25 or 26, I had my dream job, which is a really weird thing to have, um, and I still love it. So, um, And another thing that happened is that Chris Gerritz was hired to, uh, to take the place of Neil Letting. And you see here, he's so early on, he doesn't even have a phone number in the syllabus. <laughs> that, that's how new he is to Bethel. Um, but this started, this started the beginning of some really deep friendships that were going to become very productive in the course. Now, I was really nervous with Virginia being gone. I remember sitting with Barrett uh, at the end of, probably in spring of 2004, and he was asking me about how the year was going. Um, and I said to him that my goal for the year, and Sadly, my goal going forward was I just want to make sure I want to make it so people don't think Virginia's gone. Like that was my goal was that if I could do the things she was doing and the wheels didn't fall off, then then, that, then I was doing my job. Um, as the years moved on, I realized that that's an answer that um, Virginia, who was who was in, in every way my mentor, would be really upset at. But that's not really much of an aspiration. Um, and in 2005 um, was sort of a. a <laughs> A year where we started to really, I think some of the some of the younger profs in the course, newer profs in the course, really started to, to realize that the Lettingas had been gone for a couple of years and we needed to really take some ownership and make this course our own. Um, and we started to think, as I said, a lot about the image of the course and how students interact with it. So one of our great I great ideas was to, uh, to for the first day of class, instead of getting up and handing out the syllabus, that we were going to make a movie that the students watched, um, which came to be titled CWC the Movie. It's a 55-minute, um, really odd documentary about the course. Um, it's as bad of an idea as it sounds, uh, but it was a lot of fun to do. And it was the beginning of sort of building up some skills that were going to be important. Um, Chris Gertz and I made the movie. I don't think we had barely even had a conversation before then. We decided to make this, uh, this film together, together over the summer. Neither of us had ever done any kind of film work before, but we just thought, oh, sure, we could, we could figure out how to do that. Um, so this was the beginning of, of some deep friendships and some sort of building up of skills. And that brings us to the summer of 2006, which we talk about as sort of a, a magic summer in the course. Um, this was a year where, I think this is the first year that Chris, Stacy Hecht, and I sort of took over in terms of organizing the summer meetings. And we decided what we're going to do is we're going to bring in a lot of outside people to talk with us. So we brought in Chris Armstrong from the seminary to talk about church history. I know Bob Kistler came in to talk about technology. I think somebody else came in. We brought in a lot of people to tell us um, about things we could be doing and things we could be doing differently. And we really wanted to think about directions we could take the course. Um, like I said, this was also the summer that um, we decided that online CWC was a bad idea. Um, but we thought, well, we still, we still want to make changes. We want to, do, we want to try to build up this course. So this was the beginning of us looking deeply at creating a lot of media for the class. So this was the summer that... Um, I think off of a challenge from, from Greg Boyd, 
um, Chris uh, rewrote the St. Augustine rap. Um, we, we made a music video of it featuring uh, puppets because <laughs> we are odd. Um, and so, so, so we did. We did this. This is all. We also did uh, the Reformation polka um, short, which is an, an all animated, about four minutes short. Again, we had never done animation before, and we decided, well, we should learn how to do that because that mostly I wanted to do because that's what I wanted to do as a kid, right? So this is all me kind of playing out the things that I wished I could do as a kid. I realized I can do those things in CWC now, and um, and all of this was to sort of find ways to hook into the students, right? To find ways to take that sixty-minute lecture and can we put three or four minutes into that lecture that are, that's going to sort of be a change, something that they remember. And these really did become some of the major takeaways for, um, for students in the course. This is also the, um, the summer when we uh, started our podcast, CWC the Radio Show. I remember uh, Bob Kessler was talking to us about what podcasting was. I don't think any of us knew exactly what that word meant. And as he explained it, Stacy turned to me and said, so it would be like CWC the Radio Show. And I, I heard that and thought, yes, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do a radio show. And it wasn't a required thing. We thought, what if we just built this supplement to the course uh, for students who wanted to go deeper? Because we realized we did a lot for students who were struggling in the course, but we didn't do as much for students who wanted to go deeper. So we, um, we started a weekly recording. Um, and again, we had never done any kind of audio recording, any kind of podcasting. So we had to build skills um, in order to do this. Um, we did this for 11 semesters. I think we have 170 episodes that we've done. Um, and this was really, as much as this was about trying to connect with students, what this really was for us, whether a student ever listened to it, this was important because, again, this built deep relationships and friendships between uh, Chris Stacy and I initially, eventually Sarah Shady hosted a, a number of seasons of the show, Amy Pagia, <coughs> different faculty came on um, to the show at different times. So we built deep relationships, we built skills. A lot of this was, was, was for me getting comfortable in front of a microphone because if we're going to do media production, we need to know how to do that. Um, and this really became a pedagogical laboratory for us. And what we found is we would be doing things on the radio show, talking about content in a certain way, or talking about topics we'd never talked about before, and thought, you know what, that actually went really well. What if we did that in class? And so some of these online supplemental things started to feed back into the face-to-face -face course, and we would bring things we did on the show to, to the larger faculty and say, what about this? We should try this. Uh, 2007, we made... Um, more animated shorts. Uh, we did our first podcast in class session. So we, for our synthesizing essay, we interviewed some different professors who taught L courses and actually did, you know, it's, it's as hybrid as CWC had been at that point. So it was one class session where the students would, instead of attending class, would listen to this 60-minute uh, podcast that would help them write their synthesizing essay or give them content for their essay. Uh, in 2008, I think the summer of 2008, I was watching Euro Cup and I thought, I thought I was never a great athlete as a kid, so I never, I don't think I've ever won a trophy for anything. So I thought, what we should do is we should, we should have some kind of competition in CWC. Um, and we had been playing kind of games here and there when we had weird review days and we needed something to fill some time, so we would play a, a game here or there. And I thought, what if we structured this more formally into a competition where the different small groups would compete against each other? This would sort of build some enthusiasm. And then at the end of each semester, with the small group with the most points would win this trophy that we made. Um, and the first year we did this, it was very weird because nobody knew what we were doing. Like, even the props weren't quite sure what this was. But by the time we got into the second and third year, it became something that there was just a lot of enthusiasm for. Um, and we didn't do it this year because of some other changes we made in the course. And this is one that I feel like, I, I kind of like this back if we could find a way. Because it, it did just sort of build a kind of community uh, within the course. So here's some of the various games that we played. See if we match game game we called Six Degrees of Socrates. Uh, I think this was Anne Marie Koister's idea, so we took the board game Taboo and we, I made a completely CWC version of it. Um, and then my favorite was CWC Chronology Card Sharks, which um, is towing the line of gambling almost, but it super, was super fun. Um, we also did another online uh, class session uh, about Islam. And the reason we did this is it allowed us to bring in an expert. It allowed us to bring in Amy Poppinga, even when she wasn't teaching the course, into our classroom to help students understand a difficult topic. Uh, in 2009, um, the summer of 2009, my wife Ann and I took our kids to see the movie Up in Spicer, Minnesota, and we got to the movie way too early. And I sat there and watched the little slideshow go through, and, it, um, and I just realized that I was accidentally learning so much about these movies that I didn't care about. And it occurred to me, you know, we could do this in CWC, and we could just have a show that runs before students come in that is sort of prepping them for the lecture. So if you came in early and you saw what was on this screen, you saw an example of, of that. 
Um, but I would, but so I, we would tailor them to each lecture. We did this for about half a semester. Became a little unwieldy, but this is another idea that I'd like to try to bring back. I think this was a helpful, interesting thing. Because students come to class early and they don't really have anything to do. And so what I realized is we could accidentally teach them stuff. They could, they could learn things without even trying. Because you kind of like to try to answer trivia questions when you see them. Um, to spring of 2011, I was on sabbatical. Um, and my sabbatical on paper had everything to do with ASK and um, almost nothing to do with, uh, with CWC. But I had a lot of little embedded projects or side projects that I wanted to do. Um, and this is where I want to actually um, show you some of these things that we, um, that we did in the course. So the first thing I did was I, I was interested in taking our podcast and saying, could I take our podcast and turn it into a TV show? So this is, so this is our, this is our, uh, just a, a filming of our, our uh, uh, recording of our podcast. I set up a camera, and I built in sort of a structure around it. Um, this is using Adobe Presenter. So all of these things that are here could be clickable live links that could pull up PDFs of readings, that could pull up links to things that we're talking about um, and things like that. So mostly my goal here was this was like, this was, nobody's ever seen this, but this was a competition for myself to say, how quickly could I turn this around? Could I turn this around in a day or two from a recorded podcast into a, a sort of a full-fledged video? Um, and it took about 36 hours of real time. I didn't work on it for 36 hours, but um, I had this back to Chris, I think, in 36 hours. So this was just a test because we thought maybe online CWC might look like this, right? What if you, what if it kind of had that sort of feel to it? So that's one thing that we, um, that we thought about uh, on sabbatical. And then in, around April of 2011, Chris and I were talking, um, and I came to campus a lot just to talk to people, um, especially to talk to Chris. And we were standing in the the hallway, kind of by where the faculty lounge is. And I don't remember what we were talking about, but Chris said. Um, wouldn't it be great if we could take our students to CWC the museum? And I didn't understand what he meant, and then he, because I thought he meant a museum about CWC, which of course I would be on board with, but no one would want to go there. <laughs> but then he said, no, no, what if it was a museum that, that sort of taught them CWC? And this, this uh, prompted another project. And what I want to show you is kind of the evolution of an idea here. So he told me that on a Wednesday. Um, I went home since I was on sabbatical and didn't have other work, uh, other Bethel work to do, and I mocked up a really ugly version of what this might look like. So it was a museum that a student could, you know, click on, you know, so they would see a room, they could click on different doors, and they could actually move through things, they could zoom in on things and look at them. We could have, you know, we could have texts that a student could actually open up and read. We could have video, we could have audio, and I thought, well, that's a really interesting idea. Uh, but it's really ugly, and I don't like things that are that are really ugly. And this looks like something I did in a day, and it was something I did in a day. So then, I, so we talked about this, and Chris was excited about the idea, and, and I said, well, let me try to do something that looks nicer for the summer meeting, so we can show it to the faculty. So about three weeks later, I put together a mock-up um, museum of the Middle Ages. So this, if I pull up the map here, this is um, this is oh, sorry. This is not meant to actually be taught with. There's no assignment. We haven't used this in class. But I wanted to sort of show what are all the things we could do with this museum. So I just want to walk you through a couple rooms here, what this looks like. So all of this is delivered online to a student, so we can have this up on a server. Um, so if we go into our lecture hall here, we can sit and we can actually watch Sarah Shady give a lecture. Um, and if we go further on here, we can get to a point where you can actually see. We actually have her PowerPoint right here. We have her up on the screen um, lecturing. So we can we can create um, sort of mini lecture experiences. Uh, that was pretty cool. Um, we can do things like um, have texts, like I showed in the other museum. We can have a film library where we can show clips or scenes from films having to do with, with the Middle Ages or whatever the topic is. Um, we have a, a podcast room, and this has about five hours of CWC profs talking, having discussions about the Middle Ages, whether it's interviews or just, discuss, or just um, profs talking about the Middle Ages, different aspects of the Middle Ages. So students could go through that. We also have an exhibit hall. So I did a, a quick exhibit on medieval relics. So we could go and look at um, St. Clair and St. Francis's like relics from St. Clair and St. Francis with a little bit of text about them. 
if we wanted to see the, the mummified hand of Saint Saint Stephen um, from Budapest, we can take a look at we can take a look at that. We can read about that. And then my favorite room, because this is something I always taught about. I always taught students about Sharp Cathedral and the, and the windows at Sharp Cathedral, but when I put it up on a PowerPoint, you can't really see it very well, and not with any kind of detail. So I wanted to do these same windows at the back of the um, at the back of the cathedral, but I want students to be able to read these the way that they were intended. So if we click on, say, the, the Root of Jesse windows, we can go through and we can look at each window in detail with a description of what they're seeing. Um, so this can all be student guided. This is a non-linear way to deliver um, to deliver information. Now the problem is this isn't actually made to teach with, right? This we don't have. There's no not a lot of real content here. This was mostly this is mostly just showing off to our faculty to say, look what we can do, but it doesn't help us teach. So this June, once we convinced the faculty, yeah, this sounds like a cool idea. I um, went in and created a museum we could actually teach from. So this I took the uh, medieval and renaissance art lecture that I gave, that I have given for years, um, and basically uh, took from Virginia Lettinga, um, and created an online museum that we could actually use in class. Um, so the embedded in the museum is, uh, is an assignment. If we click here, we can actually see the assignment to you. Um, you don't really want to hear that, but I mean, a student can pull up the museum guide assignment with everything they need to do and all the instructions that they need. You can pull up a map, and this is this is actually a fairly robust um, full museum. There's about 70 works of art, about two, two hours and 14 minutes of um, of me telling them about different pieces. Most, so most pieces are between four and six minutes long. I talk about them, but it's, an, it's and then we have an assignment which, just like if you brought them to an actual museum, you, we can. Um, we have them go to certain things because we want a certain set of information everybody knows, and then we sort of set them free and say we want you to look for a couple other things which also speak to these issues. So it's also it's both directed by us, but it's also student guided, and they can move around, they can look at things, they can explore deeper. One of my favorite things is when we gave this assignment out in the fall, uh, we wanted to test it because we wanted to throw this at 400 students and see if it crashed, and it actually worked really well. It was fun to come into the library and watch students working on it and watch kind of how they moved around and how they looked around in the same way you would look around in a real museum. Um, so we, we started doing this and said, this is, this is what online CWC needs to look like. Because we were able to deliver what was essentially a 70-minute lecture's worth of content in a way that wasn't recording that lecture and then just giving them an MP3, but it was actually kind of a value-added experience. Um, and then this fall, we started working with creating online, or excuse me, this spring, with creating some online apps through Adobe Captivate, because here I was using Adobe Presenter, which is really, really, really not intended for this. Um, so we're pushing this about as far as it's supposed to go. This is a PowerPoint that's about or 450 slides long with a lot of audio embedded. And so I was talking with Matt Putz about what are other pieces of software that we could use, and he told me about Adobe Captivate. So I wanted to play a little bit with Captivate to sort of see how that would work. And um, I wanted to create some, some online apps that would um, either help me teach better or help students learn better. Uh, and one of the things that I wanted was I really wanted a map that would change with the timeline. So I thought, well, I could probably build something like that. So this is our unit one map in CWC. And you notice there's a timeline here at the bottom. And as I click on the timeline, you'll notice sort of the political map changes. So as we move through history, we can see the rise of the red is the rise of the Roman Empire, the expansion of the Roman Empire. And then along with that, when we're in a particular time period, we can click on the vocab we have. It'll tell the student where it is. It'll also plot Augustus Caesar on the timeline as well, so they can see when he was. Now, this is pretty cool this way. I, I, I practice with it on a smart board, and it's much cooler, because then I'm up here talking, and I say, I want to see 400. I click on it, and it changes. I can click on buttons on the screen. So this is, I've never taught with a smart board, but I thought, well, that would be kind of cool. And also imagine this bumped to an iPad, where a student can be touching the map, can be doing those kind of things. So that was a pretty interesting thing. Um, and then I started to think about other review things that I wanted to do and I was really interested in thinking about what we were doing with the CWC Cup and creating, um, creating games, creating things like that. So I created um, two, two review games. One is a map review game, um, where students struggle deeply with finding things on a map. So this, is, this looks very simplistic to you, but trust me, our students really, this helps them a lot. Um, 
in order to find things on the map. So as they're going through, if they're going to find Pelagius, and let's say they think he's from Spain, they click there and realize their score went down by five. They find him in Britain, and it's correct, and they move on to the next question. So this is something which is, excuse me, is delivered through uh, through Moodle. In the same way, I took our um, our chronology card charts game and created a game, um, a timeline game where they were given two random events and they needed to say which one came first and they could risk how many points they wanted to risk. So I mean, it's, it's a simplistic little thing, but it, but it was interesting talking to students about how they enjoyed getting involved in something that was, you know, somewhat more like a game. Um, so we tried to find ways to do that. Um, what we found with this was in the fall when we didn't have these apps, we did have some other practice things on Moodle. We had about 50 to 60 percent of our students use it. When we moved to these online apps, we were around 70 or 80 percent. And it was stuff that existed before. The usage went up as we were driving students towards Moodle because they found this stuff to be helpful. Uh, over spring break, we Chris and I sat down and started to sketch out what CWC uh, online would look like. Um, so we talked about it being this interplay between these short films, 30 minute or so films that we create, and then different museums that we would go through. And then we started to think about if you can create a museum, a physical space, you can also create sort of a three-dimensional vision of that space. So this is, you can see, this is the same space. And if you can do that and we have these museums, we started to think about what is the user interface for online CWC. And we thought, well, really what we're building is a campus, right, with these different museums. So here's our Renaissance Art Museum. Here's our office building where you can interact with Chris and I. Here's our theater where you see some of those. Um, you see some of those films. We have ample parking. We can build an international <laughs> airport if we want. So I mean, there, there's lots of things that we can do. Um, we can do to expand this and build on this. But we thought this is this is kind of what we want. Um, what we're interested in our students doing. So where do we go from here? I just have a minute or two. I want to just uh, point to a couple things. If we can explore a virtual museum, which is a you know a virtual online space, and I. And the, uh, the irony of the fact that we basically built virtual brick and mortar is not lost on me. That, that we, there's, there's something we like about that. But if you can explore a museum, why can't you explore ancient Athens? Why can't you explore a medieval manor? Right? Why can't you explore something other than a museum, another physical space? You saw the one, the one clip where you see me as a video talking to you. Why can't you encounter um, Hildegard of Bingen? You know, um, with with five dollars worth of green poster board, we can green screen us into anywhere, right? So, so it creates a lot of possibilities there. And then we start to think about some of these apps and some of these games. And what if instead of it just being a space you explore, what if you made it something like? Uh, I mean, anybody here when you were a kid play like Oregon Trail on the Apple IIe? What if we did that and you and you went on a medieval pilgrimage? And it was not only you're learning and you're encountering the Middle Ages, but you're playing a game while you do it. So I mean, these are things that are sort of off in the distance of things we think are um, we think would be good ideas. But those are those are some of the directions that we're hoping to go as we look at 2015, 2017, 2045, and, and things like that. But um, but but this is kind of the story of how we got from thinking it was a bad idea to maybe thinking it's a good idea. And I will say we'll close with this: the biggest thing that I'm excited about isn't how that I think this is better than face-to-face CWC because I don't. But I'm interested in the fact that just like the radio show helped feed our face-to-face -face course, helped us as kind of a laboratory for what we do when we're sitting in a room with students, that I'm hoping that this becomes a laboratory that feeds our face-to-face -face course. This allows us to do things with the classroom that we weren't allowed or weren't able to do before or didn't have the ideas to do before. So I'm excited about where this goes and maybe sometime in the future we'll give you an update. So thank you very much.